Hey, everybody. Welcome to the GMI Rocket Show. Today is episode number 76. I'm your host, Roman Zelichenko. I am a former immigration attorney turned entrepreneur, the founder of Laborless, which is an immigration tech startup that automates H-1B visa compliance, and also the founder of GMI Rocket, which is an immigration-focused uh, digital marketing agency. Uh, we work with immigration firms and global mobility companies and other companies in the space, uh, and which also brings you, of course, this show. Today, I'm super excited. We're diving back into a like specific immigration law tech company. Uh, our, our, our guest today is June Ahn, who is the CEO and co-founder of a company called Lawfully. Um, and so Lawfully is basically an, an AI-powered kind of immigration, almost visa, like case anal analysis company. Uh, folks can sign up to Lawfully on their Android or iPhone and share some information and they get they can get uh, some uh, data and analysis on their case in terms of, you know, what's the likelihood of certain outcomes? What is the likelihood of a timeline for them? Uh, obviously, you know, this is based on an analysis of a ton of data that the company has and, and really cool kind of uh, algorithms and, and machine learning that they, they leverage. So it's really, you know, it's going deep into the tech and it's very specific to immigration. So I'm very excited to have this conversation. Um, and of course, we can't have this conversation without June. So June, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I'm super excited to jump into your into your story. Thank you, Roman, for inviting me to your show. I hope uh, I hope that was a, a decent, you know, sort of non-confusing introduction because I think what you guys are doing is really, really exciting and, and, and very technical. So I'm, I'm, you know, excited to explore it. Wow, that was one of the, uh, the best introductions for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Great. Um, before we jump in, you know, for folks who are joining, who are watching, tuning in, please tell us who you are, say hello, shout yourself out in the comments, uh, maybe tell us where you work or where you're kind of watching from. I think it's always really fun to see how many people are here, especially live. Um, obviously, as we're going through the story, please ask us questions. If you have questions for June or comments or you agree with him or something, you know, uh, leave a comment. And obviously, again, if you like the show and you're enjoying it, please give a thumbs up or a clap or depending on wh wherever you're watching it, give us some love. Um, so, so June, I, you know, there's so much, I can't wait to get into the story of Lawfully because I'm so just personally so excited about the, the, the product and what you're building. Uh, but of course, I always love to kind of learn more. And I think it's really important to learn more about, you know, the, the founder, the co-founder and sort of why, who you are, a little bit about you and why you ended up building it. Um, so you have a really cool story because you are again also an immigrant to the U.S. So you kind of went through that personal experience. You know, I know you grew up in, in South Korea. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, who is June as maybe a, a younger kid? Like you were, a, <laughs> you ended up, you ended up becoming a scientist, right? So yeah. were you always into science? Were you, you know, did you play with computers? Like what, who were you when you were, when you were little or younger? Um, yeah. Um, I was born in Korea and raised in Korea. Um, I was, well, looking back, uh, my younger days, um, I was a kind of, nerdy student, uh, nerdy kid. Um, to be honest, um, I never thought I'd become an entrepreneur. And I always I was curious about science, uh, math, um, numbers, uh, data, uh, things like that. So um, it's uh, what has driven me to where I am uh, right now, because obviously what we are doing now is also uh, connected from what I was doing in the past. So, um, however, I was always uh, curious about uh, society and uh, politics, uh, how people are living uh, elsewhere. So, um, I, after my first degree, uh, I decided to go to uh, Japan, Tokyo, uh, for my master's degree. I spent two years there, uh, and then uh, I moved on uh, to England for my PhD. So I spent five years there, and then uh, in my last year uh, of PhD, I attended a conference in the U.S. that was actually in Florida, Orlando, and then I had a, a very interesting conversation uh, with a professor, So, uh, and then he offered me a job uh, to work in the U.S. Uh, after my PhD. So as a uh, last year PhD student, I was uh, looking for several job opportunities, uh, some jobs in the U.S., some jobs 
in Europe, in England, and then um, I decided uh, to join their group uh, in the U.S. So that's how I landed my first job as a PhD in the U.S. <laughs> now, let me ask you this. I mean, you, you obviously, it sounds like you were looking around. You know, you grew up in, did you grow up in Seoul or were you outside of a different city or a different area? Uh, that's a different city, mm -hmm. southern part of the country. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, you, you grew up in, you grew up in, in, uh, in Korea and, um, did you, you didn't want to go like, did you want to go back or were you, was the goal always to live elsewhere and maybe work elsewhere? I, yes, that's a good question. Actually, um, I always, uh, I was always curious about, uh, other part of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wanted to spend at least some uh, time uh, in other countries. Uh, that's why I kept moving on uh, from my, after my uh, first degree to Tokyo, to England, and then to the U.S. So uh, uh, that was my dream. And uh, in a sense, a uh, dream came true. And um, the first few years uh, in the U.S. and then I got established uh, in New Jersey. And then uh, after that, I uh, I just uh, stayed there uh, working uh, for almost 15 years mm -hmm. before uh, I started the startup. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you, I, I'm curious, you know, when you were, when you were a kid, I mean, it sounds like you said that you were not, you never envisioned yourself as a business founder or an entrepreneur. So I'm assuming that you were not the kind of kid who, you know, sold rocks or collected and sold baseball cards or washed cars or something. Were you, you were, were you more kind of, you know, studying and reading and learning? Is that sort of that's how correct. you, how you yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I was not very sporty, uh, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> uh, I, I love reading. Uh, I love um, you know, devoting myself uh, to math and physics, uh, science courses. Um, but I had a uh, very uh, interesting habit of uh, taking uh, trouble uh, to elsewhere, uh, away from my hometown. So that actually gave me uh, some you know, fresh ideas and refreshment every time. So when I came back home uh, where I was, uh, I always uh, had a, uh, I was always able to uh, start uh, a fresh uh, mm -hmm. start. So that's um, something I, I already enjoyed. And then probably uh, that's what has driven me uh, to uh, the courses I took in my life and then uh, what I am doing right now. Did you, when you said that you travel outside of your home, did you, was that within Korea or did you actually travel internationally when you were younger? Oh, uh, at that time, just uh, within, the, within Korea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did your family travel at all? And, and you know, was there any sort of idea of going in a, outside the yes. country? Yes, uh, my family uh, loved uh, traveling. Our uh, family trip was quite often, and um, so we actually you know, traveled around uh, inside the country. But um, outside, uh, abroad, uh, travel abroad was not very common. I mean, at that time, mm -hmm. it was like uh, more than two, twenty years ago. So uh, my uh, master's degree uh, to Tokyo was actually uh, my first uh, real travel abroad. Wow. It's quite interesting now. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, you know, it's so fascinating to think about how the world has gotten so much smaller. You know, people people take trips, international trips on a weekend. Um, do you, so so that that's fascinating. When you, so when, when you came to, you know, to Japan, to Tokyo for, for your master's, how was that experience for you? You know, was it, was it a bit of a culture shock? Um, did you know what to expect? Did you speak any, any Japanese at all? Um, well, actually, uh, that was interesting. Uh, Tokyo was, uh, it's, it's not too far away from Korea, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's also uh, the Eastern culture. So, of course, there is clear difference between Korea and Japan. Uh, but I was uh, relatively comfortable. Mm. So, uh, and Japan, uh, there were a lot of uh, international students in my school. I was able to uh, hang around with a lot of them. And uh, the dorm was only uh, for international students. Uh, mm -hmm. So we used to gather uh, every evening. We used to cook together. Uh, we used to go out in the, uh, during the weekend. Uh, so it was a really uh, nice experience. And then um, 
I, to be honest, I didn't uh, speak a single Japanese when I first came because uh, the coursework and everything, the program was, everything was in, in English. So I didn't mm. have to speak. However, I took some Japanese classes and there is some similarity between Korean and Japanese. And uh, I was able to uh, learn Japanese quite quickly. So uh, uh, my friends, my Japanese friends were quite shocked uh, because <laughs> I was able to uh, talk with them in Japanese in three months. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's so cool. And you and your master's degree was about two years, right? Uh, oh, yeah, that was for two years. For two years. And so, and I know you went on to your PhD afterwards, but, you know, Japan is obvious. I mean, it's one of the largest economies in the world. Um, and I mean, so is, so is Korea, but, you know, I guess were there were there ever thoughts of okay let me stay here I've now learned the language a little bit I've made some friends there's job opportunities maybe continue studies there or were you itching to move on to yet another country and have another cultural experience oh yes uh, so that's true um, obviously yeah uh, at that time uh, that was clear to me that I wanted to move on to another culture uh, for a new experience. I was uh, much younger than now, and then, yeah, I was always curious about the outside world, and uh, Japan was uh, relatively close uh, to the Korean culture. So, uh, yeah, and then um, I applied um, to several universities in, uh, in England and, and the U.S., and then I decided uh, to go to London. Mm -hmm. and can you tell me a little bit about uh, what was that experience for you kind of I don't know, arriving in London and, and, uh, oh. <laughs> and what was that, what was that first, uh, experience that you had there? Oh yeah. Um, that was actually a culture shock. That was a real culture shock after Japan. Japan was kind of a buffer zone for me <laughs> and, uh, England people, I mean, English people are different. Uh, they are not the same as Americans. They are, not the same as uh, Japanese or Korean or even Chinese. And um, their unique culture uh, was a shock to me because uh, before I went to London, I thought, uh, oh, uh, English people, they might be similar uh, to Americans and, and American culture. I thought I, I, was, uh, I was used to from movies and TV shows and everything, but they were not. <laughs> and. Uh, so um, I still remember uh, when I first uh, went to London, a friend of mine who had spent already you know, five years uh, at that time, he said, uh, oh, it will be a shock to you now. However, uh, in a few years, uh, you will feel their culture, uh, their uh, habits, uh, their way of thinking as uh, you get soaked with the English rain. So uh, that was that was actually quite a poetic expression. However, <laughs> I didn't understand what it meant. Uh, but um, in actually three years, I started uh, to realize what it really meant. Uh, so in my third, uh, fourth year, before I left in five years, uh, then uh, I got used to them and I, I made really uh, good friends, many good friends in England. Hmm. What do you remember about, you know, like, what did you do, I guess? Because this kind of goes into the narrative of being an immigrant and, and moving to a new place, even if, whether it's for school or work or, or anything else, what was it like for you? Kind of, what do you remember about trying to acclimate or trying to kind of establish yourself? Because now you're here for at least five years. I mean, who knows? Maybe you would have stayed for work or, or a professor position or something. So do you remember what you did sort of as a new immigrant to the country uh, where after you've experienced this culture shock, uh, to, to kind of get settled in a little bit. Yes. Um, okay. First of all, uh, I was at the time I was a, uh, last year PhD student in physics and I was looking for a, a good job opportunity. And, um, at the time I'm still, it's true. Uh, the U S had a lot more, uh, excellent job opportunities, uh, than England or in Europe. So that was my, uh, first. Uh, criterion uh, to you know for my job selection for my for the decision to uh, whether to stay or move uh, to the US so uh, I was lucky that I was offered a job opportunity uh, from the professor uh, and 
And then um, thinking of my uh, culture, uh, cultural experience. Uh, so I, I spent two years in Tokyo, spent five years in London. Why not uh, having uh, some more years of experience in the US? Uh, that, that was my thought. So uh, it was actually quite easy uh, to make a decision uh, to move on to the US. Wow, yeah. Uh, and, and, and... Yeah, sorry. If I had a family, maybe uh, I might have made a different decision, but I was single at the time. So it was uh, quite straightforward. And, and it's, and you know, I guess I'm, I'm kind of projecting or maybe assuming, but you know, you made this statement about how you had assumptions of English culture based on your knowledge of American culture. And obviously it was a little bit different, but I would imagine at this point, you know, you've watched the movies, you watch some shows, you know, for what it's worth, American culture is kind of pretty global. It probably was exciting to say, okay, I'm actually going to go and live in this place that I've seen on TV and in the movies and, and things like that. Um, because obviously your prior experience uh, in the UK was was obviously different because it is a very different culture. I feel like I imagine that would have been I would have, that would have been really fun, you know, to make it. I mean, I mean, and I'm making a generalization here, but I think of a lot of kids in the U.S. who grew up, you know, reading manga and watching, um, mm -hmm. you know, all, all, all sorts of all sorts of cartoons coming out of uh, Japan, for example. They like it's like it's like a fantasy to go and travel and actually visit uh, yeah. Japan and based on. And obviously yeah. these are cartoons and this is the real world, but there's this like concept in your mind. So I just I wonder if there's a little bit of that excitement coming here after all those years spending you know, living in other parts of the world. That is true. Uh, that's obviously true. Um, I mean, usually uh, Asian people are exposed to uh, American cultures a lot, uh, but not too much uh, English culture, for example. Uh, some Japanese culture as well, uh, because Jap Japan is close and we consume some Japanese mangas uh, like you do. Um, but uh, the majority was actually uh, the American culture uh, influence. So I was very used to that. And um, I just naively thought when I first uh, went to uh, London, oh, English people, American people, they're the same. Uh, <laughs> they must be uh, they must be similarly behaving and uh, things like that. But uh, they had a very uh, unique, uh, their own culture yeah. and um, as I, as I said before, it took me uh, some time to get used to them, to get used to their culture uh, to, and to the people. But um, looking back now, uh, the five years uh, in England, now it remains a kind of a nostalgia uh, for me. Uh, so I never had a chance uh, to go back to England for an ex extended period of time, just for a couple of times of uh, tourism. But um, it, um, it was uh, really a nice, nice experience. Uh, but now uh, I opened up a new revenue, a new avenue. <laughs> okay, so no, I, I'm a startup founder, so revenue is very important. <laughs> <laughs> revenue is on your mind all the time. <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah, that, that's really cool. No, th thanks for sharing that because I, I think it's it's really interesting to hear, you know, what it's like for different people to move around and experience different cultures for this for the first time. So I, I want to jump into your kind of, you know, U.S. journey. So at this point, you've gotten your your bachelor's degree. You got your ma in, in Korea, you got your master's in Japan, you got your Ph.D. in the U.K. in England. Um, and now you've come to the U.S. Uh, to work at, uh, at the university. Right. Um, yes. Now you came as a J1 scholar, is mm -hmm. that, that's right. So can that's you correct. talk a little bit about, you know, what was your experience, I guess, coming to the US, uh, you know, on a visa and, and uh, did it differ from your prior experiences as a student in other countries, or did you feel that the student immigration process was fairly straightforward and sort of handled by the institution? Um. For me, uh, my own visa experience was, uh, to be honest, it was not very hard uh, because I uh, I belong to a big organization, the university, uh, and their uh, system protected me and they provided me with necessary uh, visa processes and everything. So I came to uh, the U.S. as a J-1 and then they moved me quickly uh, to H-1B and because it's a university, it's kept exempt. 
Mm. So I didn't have to wait. Um, and then uh, I moved on uh, in my second year of H1B uh, to uh, EB2 NIW. And um, I had my own uh, research career and some strong uh, paper uh, publication records and everything. So um, USCIS, for some reason, uh, they took me uh, quite easily. And I seem to remember it only took me like uh, six months uh, for my EB2 NIW. And um, I think uh, since then, but that was in 2006. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I know it has become a lot harder and um, uh, it's taking a lot longer. It's uh, becoming a lot harder. Um, but even at that time when I was going through all these processes, I used to, I knew uh, a lot of my friends uh, having different jobs, uh, different areas, uh, they had trouble. I remember uh, one guy, uh, he was laid off uh, abruptly. And I think at that time, uh, the H-1B grace period was only like 10 days or something like that. Uh, it was crazy. And um, he ended up uh, having to, uh, returning uh, to Korea uh, and uh, you name you name a number of cases uh, that had a, a difficult uh, situ their uh, difficult immigration situations and to uh, and taking care of uh, their immigration status so um, I I knew a lot of my friends uh, having uh, trouble and some of them had to you know, quit their job. Some of them had to return to their home countries. Um, so it's uh, it's as a first generation immigrant, uh, it's always heartbreaking uh, to see them suffering, uh, to see them having to do what's not really necessary uh, for their life. Hmm. And and of course now you know you, you work with hundreds, thousands of people and, and kind of interact with different people going through various stages of the immigration process. And mm -hmm. I, I guess that feeling doesn't really, doesn't really go away. I mean, to your point, even if you have, you know, a, a, a almost picture perfect immigration experience and, you know, your, your research is strong and all that stuff, it's the kind of thing that a lot of people would really wish they had. And even you had all, you know, anxiety, it sounds like, and just uncertainty about the immigration process, which is a really good reminder that, you know, it doesn't matter how great a case, quote unquote, sounds, you know, to the outside world, immigration is stressful for everybody, right. for everybody. It doesn't matter, you know, in no amount of money that your organization can throw at, you know, your visa application will assure you 100%. You're never sure until you have that approval notice in your hand officially right. from the government. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and uh, some some uh, universities or some uh, big organizations don't always do a good job quickly for you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I know a lot of friends. Uh, they had to uh, wait unnecessarily longer, uh, you no, know, because the the organization didn't do a necessary step uh, promptly in time. Uh, so uh, it really depends on. Uh, your situation and uh, on your on your sponsor and everything. Yeah. Uh, so I want to I want to pause just very quickly for folks. Anybody who's watching, again, give us a shout out. Give us a comment in the you know show, uh, uh, leave a comment. Um, tell us where you are. Tell us who you are. Tell us maybe where you work. Uh, and of course, again, as we go, please ask uh, June any questions or me. I guess if you have any questions for me too, um, just to kind of make it make it exciting. Um, so, so June, I, I want to, before we kind of jump into what lawfully does, uh, and, and kind of the whole nexus of the idea, I want to talk a little bit about your, your research just very briefly, because I think it's really fascinating. And it is of course, part of the story, um, of lawfully. So, I mean, you were, a, I mean, you were a scientist, you know, I know this, it sounds silly, but you know, I'm a lawyer. So scientist to me, sounds incredibly, you know, impressive and just, and, and out of reach for me, definitely. Um, what did you do? Like, what did that mean for you? What was your career? What was your day-to-day -day work? What were you researching? Kind of tell me a little bit about what that work I was see. for you. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, my research uh, was on physics, uh, obviously. And um, I mean, I didn't want, I don't want to uh, go into too much detail uh, on the subject. However, 
it is uh, basically uh, dealing with data, uh, a lot of data uh, from experiments, a lot of data from uh, theoretical considerations and simulations. Um, so uh, I spent most of my time uh, looking at a number of uh, data sets and try to find uh, what the correlation between this data set and that data set, uh, how uh, this quantity, for example, uh, like physical quantity is going to behave uh, under uh, certain conditions. Uh, if you change your condition from A to B, then uh, what's uh, going to be like you know, to predict you know, such a thing. So uh, my job was always uh, how to analyze these numbers more effectively and how to uh, draw, how to retrieve insights uh, from the mountains of numbers. Uh, so I was always uh, curious about how to analyze uh, these more effectively and how to uh, get a better uh, insight uh, from my uh, analysis. Uh, so uh, as you know, uh, in 2015, uh, 16, uh, the big surge of machine learning uh, techniques and uh, AI technologies. Uh, so scientists uh, were hit. Uh, and usually, uh, scientists are, are the people who are driven by curiosity. Uh, so was I. And uh, I was very curious about uh, how to use uh, this new techniques uh, to apply to my own research topics. And, uh, and then we formed a group, uh, a study group, uh, to look into these, uh, how to apply this uh, more effectively. And, and then as my knowledge uh, grows, I uh, quickly realized it's uh, far, the it application was far beyond uh, physics. And then I started talking about that uh, at, uh, at the dinner table uh, to my wife, uh, <laughs> Judy. Uh, so uh, she, uh, she has been uh, practicing for over uh, 20 years now. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, she, she was uh, working with, uh, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, a lot of uh, Silicon Valley uh, companies, uh, startups, and so she knew, she had some impression about uh, how uh, this technology is affecting or how it is going to affect uh, this landscape. And then, you know, the legal tag and, and stuff like that. So uh, she responded to me, oh, I heard uh, something like legal tag and uh, it sounds like uh, if you use this kind of uh, technologies, then you can use uh, uh, a lot of things are really cool and uh, very laborless, <laughs> laborlessly. <laughs> so um, uh, that's uh, how these ideas uh, started. And then, and then I was curious. Okay, uh, if I can uh, really apply uh, these techniques uh, to the uh, to the immigration uh, domain, and then I, I asked Judy. Uh, for some anonymized uh, uh, data uh, for analysis, I, I was looking into that. But uh, to be honest, it was actually the data set was too small. I mean, data set from one uh, immigration lawyer offices, uh, it's, it's not big enough. So I realized uh, we needed uh, a much bigger data set. So typically in legal tech domain, uh, you get a case law. Uh, for your analysis. However, as you know, in immigration, there is no case law. Once uh, your case uh, received decision from USCIS, it's just gone, it's just between you and your lawyer. So uh, I thought, okay, this is probably uh, what we should get uh, from the immigrants uh, themselves. And then how to do that? I mean, I had no idea at the time. And um, then, you no. Know, I tried uh, uh, different things uh, online, tried to get some data set uh, online and then uh, tested this and that. And then finally I decided to take a leave uh, from my work. Uh, that was for three months uh, first and then I extended it uh, for one and a half a year. By the time uh, when I needed to make a decision uh, to go back to work or 
quit. Uh, I was pretty sure uh, I, I would be able to get something meaningful uh, out of this data set. So that's um, how I decided uh, to quit my job and started to start up. <laughs> wow. And just to be clear, um, your, your wife, Judy, is an immigration lawyer. Yeah. So so you when you were talking at the dinner table, you were talking about you know, what you're working on. And she's thinking from an immigration lawyer perspective. And obviously, of course, you went through the immigration law process. You knew that there was uncertainty and that there was kind of, you know, stress around it. Um, so that that's that's so fascinating. It's also great because I feel like individuals in your position are really in such a good uh you find yourself in such a good place to make connections between different parts of society and build a bridge. So you were in, you know, in big, you're working with data, you're working in a, in a physics lab, I guess, right. Uh, at a, you know, doing research and then which was your world. And then you were talking to, you know, Judy about immigration. And of course you were able to sort of can make that connection, which is, I think where a lot of innovation you know, comes from it, it really yeah, does yeah. take, it would be hard for an immigration lawyer to be exposed to AI and, you know, machine learning at an early stage, because it's just not part of our day to day life. Um, so I just, I think that's really, I think that's really cool. And I think a lot of great entrepreneurship and a lot of good business ideas come from this combination of two disparate things, uh, you know, to solve a particular problem. I, I guess I, I'm curious, from you know from your perspective so you quit your job which is i mean huge you spent almost a decade studying you know undergraduate no actually more way more than a decade right undergraduate master's degree and a phd and then you spent working you know over a decade working i mean this was a this was a full career in which you were an expert a, a, you know a, a really serious expert that you gave up basically. I mean, I'm assuming that any university would be happy to hire you back again if you ever wanted to join. But at that point to your, you know, as we, as you were saying, you kind of decided to leave the job. I'm curious, you know, you mentioned you thought that you could get some more meaningful insight out of that data. Like, what did you think you were going to do? Because that's a big decision to make. Right. And, you right. know, okay, you get the data, you run the numbers, you get some sort of conclusion out of it congratulations, you just quit your job to get this. Now what, you know, how do you, how, what did you envision at that time in terms of using this data somehow to replace your career, you know, and, and, and do something new? Um, yes, yes. Um, okay, I, I have to say, uh, I was scared as well. That's a scary decision. And, um, and that's why oh, I didn't dive into this uh, immediately. I, at first, I took it as a side project and then I took a leave uh, three months and six months and then I decided uh, to take it seriously for time. Um, I think uh, it's, it all started from curiosity. Um, it, in the sense that uh, the physics that I spent uh, like 20 years or so, uh, that was a comfort zone. Uh, of course, there are a lot of things uh, I, I should explore, I can explore. However, that's more or less uh, established area and I could keep going. Looking at this new data set and uh, thinking of how uh, the fruitful outcome could affect uh, other people's lives. This is a new uh, world. Uh, I was really curious how uh, about how this could evolve and how this could develop itself to a different stage and uh, to the stage that could affect change other people's lives. So um, I cannot lie, I was not scared, uh, I was scared. However, um, at, at some point, you know, you need to make a decision and looking at the data I have and looking at um, the, the, the conclusions at the time that could have, uh, developed, uh, this premature, uh, outcome to the next stage. Um, I thought, um, it's, it's really, um, I was, I was, uh, willing, uh, to take the risk. Uh, so 
I think it's all, uh, if you're curious about what is going to come next, and if you are, if you feel comfortable uh, what you have, and what, how this could be related uh, to your curiosity, then you can make a decision. Uh, so probably, uh, I think that's what happened to me. And, and maybe this is a little bit of a personal question. And so obviously, you know, feel free to share as much or as little as you want. But you know, you must have had a conversation with your wife about, listen, I'm going to leave my job. I'm going to leave my salary job, my, you know, professor job. Um, you know, was that a discussion? Was that a consideration that you guys, that you, you know, you and your family had to, to have and, and say, look, I'm going to give myself maybe X amount of time before I either, you know, make a decision as to whether I'm going to stay or go back. Maybe there's, you know, fundraising or something. Again, it, it, you know, it's scary to, to leave your job but then, of course, the practical aspect of it is you lose a salary. Um, yeah. So how did you navigate that? And, and I ask this because, you know, when I left my job and started working on you know, what eventually became laborless, um, I had savings saved up. But of course, I, you know, I was I didn't have I wasn't married. You know, I, I didn't have a family and I was actually I moved home. So I didn't even have to pay for rent. And even though I still wish I stayed longer and saved a little bit more money. Um, yeah. I had a much bigger kind of, I had less responsibility for other people and, and, and still it was scary. A lot of professionals, um, especially in this industry, they come to an idea later on in their career when they've seen enough and they found an issue and they want to solve it. But again, at that point, they have mouths to feed, they have a mortgage to pay, et cetera. Yeah. How did, yeah. how did you think about that? Cause I, I think this could be maybe helpful for other people. Yeah. Um, so, yes. So at first, um, I talked to Judy, uh, probably I could go back. I, if it if doesn't work very well, I'll go back in a year uh, or so. Of course, it never happened. Um, however, uh, I mean, she has, she had a full-time job and uh, I had a full-time job. And um, you know, we, I had some savings uh, from my uh, 15 years uh, of working uh, as a PhD. So I thought uh, it's gonna help uh, a little bit. However, if, to be honest, if uh, my wife wasn't a co-founder and if my, my wife uh, didn't have a full-time job, I'm not sure uh, if I could have done it uh, easily. Uh, so um, in that sense, I'm really grateful uh, to her for her understanding and actually her passion uh, to explore uh, and navigate uh, this new avenue um, to a completely different world. And um, I think she. this is partly because uh, she had been working with startups uh, already uh, for so long. Uh, so she had also some idea how technologies are changing the world. And so uh, with, with this expertise I have uh, and her own expertise combined, uh, we could uh, probably uh, explore a lot more uh, useful things. Uh, so I really uh, thank her uh, for her understanding and everything. Yeah, it's tough, right? You, you, it's it's really it's it's amazing to have a support system, both you know emotionally, financially, and then of course from an expertise standpoint. Uh, it's it's a really good it's a really good point. And I would also argue that listen, not everybody's in that position, and. and you know, it's unfortunate that if somebody's held back from starting a company and doing something great um, for those reasons. But I also argue that, and, and I'll ask you this kind of maybe a little bit later on, but I would argue that the experience of going through starting a company, thinking through a solution, et cetera, it gives you something in addition to the skills and knowledge you already have. And so if worst case scenario, nothing works out, I actually believe that it could make you more marketable to go back to the workforce and uh, you know maybe do something different or interesting for somebody else with your new skills. Yeah, so, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, if, for example, if I want to uh, go back uh, to physics, uh, I'm not sure uh, if they would be willing. Uh, however, uh, I now have, as a physicist, uh, you no. Know, the last uh, four years or so of uh, blank period uh, is not a positive. However, I have now uh, a lot other, a lot more other experiences. I had to manage my startups and 
uh, development uh, with my co-founders and everything, um, I, I'm i pretty sure I could um, find uh, a different job somewhere else. Uh, so uh, I'm not uh, too worried about that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and that's what I always try to remind uh, founders who are nervous about it. Um, so I, I want to kind of, you know, at this point, I want to jump into what lawfully is and does. Obviously, you, you know, you were working on this data modeling and, and prediction and analysis. Um, you, you know, you started working with Judy and collecting data and seeing, I'm assuming, some early results. Um, and, and that drove you to continue to work on the product. And so that begs the question of, well, what is the product? What is lawfully yeah. today? And what does the company do? So what can you, what can you share about that so that folks can sort of get an understanding of, of, of where lawfully is today? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I I actually have uh, another co-founder of mine, uh, Song Tzu Kim. He's uh, from he's a developer uh, from Samsung. So I was a data guy. Uh, Jui is a, a legal uh, expertise, but we still needed a person who can actually uh, develop things, uh, backend system, uh, uh, mobile app, and you know. Front end, uh, front end systems and everything. So um, I met him uh, in a uh, TensorFlow uh, study group uh, before I started uh, this startup. So uh, we discussed a little bit and then uh, we got uh, closer and closer. And um, uh, I tried, uh, of course, I tried to convince him uh, from the beginning. However, it took me uh, some time. He didn't join immediately. And, <laughs> and finally, um, after I started uh, this startup, uh, he joined our company. Uh, and then uh, he decided uh, to make a full commitment. Uh, so he became uh, one of our uh, co-founders. So I was lucky uh, in in the sense that I had him uh, from the beginning. So our uh, development tasks were taken care of uh, by him. So uh, now we have uh, like uh, five developers and a few uh, designers, uh, product managers. Uh, we are uh, 10 people uh, team right now. Uh, so what we are doing is um, our app uh, provides detailed information about immigrants, immigration status. So, uh, for example, if you uh, after you uh, apply, if you, after you submit uh, your application, your green card application, your uh, work visa, whatever, then you need to wait like uh, one year, two years. Uh, so the shortest maybe two months, and you don't know uh, what's going on uh, during the time and uh, people are very curious and nervous and they want to know where the application is and how others uh, are being processed uh, when they're gonna hear uh, from the USCIS or things like that how likely their applications are going to be approved uh, things like that so um, that's the pain point we figured out uh, so uh, and by addressing that pain point, number one, uh, we are able to provide really uh, useful information to immigrants. Number two, we are able to uh, collect case data from immigrants themselves. And uh, they are willing to share uh, their information with us because uh, they know if they do so, and if they do more then they would be able to get uh, more detailed data. So uh, it's like a uh, really uh, a good uh, circulation, uh, a circle, uh, nice circle of uh, data provision and data collection. So that was uh, our first product. And uh, since people uh, need to wait a lot, uh, during the process and they have a lot of questions. Uh, sometimes they need to prepare themselves uh, for the interviews. So uh, that's why uh, we added uh, the platform where you know, uh, immigration lawyers on board and then uh, people can get consultations uh, with the lawyers. So uh, that was our uh, second feature uh, of the app and um, 
we also added a community. So uh, people, they join our community and ask questions, uh, answer uh, each question, uh, exchange uh, between each other. So uh, it's actually very active uh, communities. Uh, so uh, they, uh, they get uh, they benefit uh, from our data analytics and consultations, uh, interview preparation and community uh, from other people. So uh, that's the uh, nutshell uh, of our service at the moment. So let me ask you something. Um, when you first started getting that data, uh, you know, what was that initial data set? I mean, did you have to oh. sort of, you had to sort of first convince people to give you the case data to get enough of it to produce a sufficient analysis, right? Oh, uh, no, that wasn't possible. Uh, so I actually uh, needed to go to the internet and uh, to collect uh, the publicly available data. So uh, people uh, share their case timelines and everything here and there. Uh, wow. there, are, uh, there are a lot of uh, groups uh, that share uh, their case information. So uh, we searched a lot of them, uh, some groups uh, that are a lot of uh, more uh, data, some groups that are less data. So we searched them all and we collected them all. Of course, um, let's say in the end, less than 10% of the data are useful uh, for the analysis. So the first uh, analysis result was rather very crude because uh, no, we didn't have uh, many data. There are a lot of noises and stuff, but uh, we were able to get something to provide to our users. So that was the starting point. And then people uh, saw the, the data, the, the result uh, for their personalized conditions. And then uh, they were willing uh, to share their own data with us. Uh, so that's uh, when we started collecting our own uh, case data from people. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you, you had to do a lot of the work on your own and scrape the internet and input it <laughs> manually, basically, right? To build that first data set. Yeah, it took us two years to do that. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, but that's, uh, it, yeah, you, you, because you have to have something of value for those initial customers for them to, you know, be the first ones to give you their data. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's tough. I, I commend you for doing that. <laughs> um, and, and, and a question for you, are most of the people who use, or at least in the beginning, uh, or most of the people who use lawfully or used lawfully, were they, or are they people who tend to self petition? Cause obviously there's a, there's a feature where you can connect with a lawyer, but many, many, many people fill out their own applications, especially if it's relatively simple, although as a lawyer, I would say almost no application is simple, but there are, you know, very straightforward cases. Is that who tends to be the the user, uh, the lawfully user? Half of them are self petition. Half of them uh, use their own lawyers. Uh, mm. So we figured out. Mm, interesting. And so mm -hmm. they use their they use their own lawyers, and obviously the lawyer is taking care of the immigration case and and is helping them answering them answering their questions but the applicant themselves separately are using lawfully to get some insights about average wait times and maybe some other statistical analysis yes correct and uh, some of their lawyers uh, we hear uh, from our users that they were recommended uh, our app by their lawyers uh, mm. because uh, the lawyers themselves it's a headache right i mean the clients, uh, they call them every day. I'm not every day, but they call them, ask questions that they don't even know. Uh, so uh, they, for the lawyers as well, uh, uh, recommending their clients uh, to use our app saves time and effort uh, mm -hmm. for their own business. And the questions that they may have are, hey, how much longer is it going to take? Hey, when is my when is my case going to be adjudicated? And of course, I'll probably a lot of lawyers look at some general guidelines. Sometimes USCIS provides wait times, but the range could be quite big. Yeah. yeah. So is the is the idea that when they go to lawfully, they'll get you know based on kind of available data and your your user your users and the analysis that you guys run is the idea that you're able to give them more specific timelines that tend to be correct. Yes, uh, I think uh, our data is more correct, I mean, more precise, uh, I mean, uh, more, uh, 
how to describe this? Uh, more personalized uh, than the USCIS uh, for for our users uh, because uh, everybody has a different condition, and uh, depending on uh, their condition, their service centers, uh, their priority dates, and their you know, case types and categories. Uh, Depending on a lot of parameters, uh, you get a different result for your processing time, for your uh, approval rate, uh, RFE issue rate, uh, things like that. So that's uh, the where uh, we get different, uh, distinctive uh, data result from the USCIS and other uh, information sources. Got it. And then, of course, you mentioned that you provide some connections to immigration lawyers, um, number one, for consultation and support if the person doesn't have a lawyer. And then you said you, you also provide connections with, it sounds like, uh, former consular officers or USCIS yes. officers for interview prep. So is it sort of, you know, so there's the one piece of the business or, or the, the, the product, which is um, predictive analytics, you know, to give users a peace of mind and to give them a little bit of insight or maybe better insight into when they can expect some sort of movement or adjudication on their case. The second one almost, it sounds a little bit like a, like a marketplace almost where mm -hmm. these individuals can connect, be connected to professionals to help them with both their case and, and prep. Um, so, you know, where does, where does it stand? I don't know. What, can you talk a little bit more about that? Cause I think, you know, now you're adding value to the user. And so, you know, where do you see, I guess, the business growing or, or um, I don't know, what can you share about that? Yes. Um, our users, uh, they, so basically uh, immigrants need a lot of services. So this is uh, to focus on their immigration, to manage their immigration uh, status. So um, obviously uh, legal advice, uh, legal uh, recommendations uh, from lawyers uh, they need uh, from time to time, uh, even though they have their own uh, lawyers. So uh, they oftentimes they need second opinions and uh, some of our users, uh, they do consultations like multiple times uh, with multiple lawyers on a single uh, topic. So that uh, they get you know, their own uh, sense uh, how to uh, deal with their issue and uh, what to do next. Uh, so uh, that's the that's an example uh, of our extra service. So uh, this case tracking and analysis is the backbone of our service. And while they use the service, they need a lot more other services. So legal consultations is, a, is a one example. Uh, interview prep is another example. And there are actually uh, many more other, even not a uh, legal domain. So uh, we, that's, the, that's the direction, that's the vision of our business expansion. So this uh, case analysis, case analytics is the baseline and we keep adding other values uh, for our users uh, so that they can uh, they can take care of uh, other services uh, in their life in in the US yeah no it's it's that's great I mean and it makes sense once they're there if they can have support for other parts of their journey as an immigrant uh, that's that's phenomenal um, I think that brings me to a question about maybe the business side of things you know, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, I'm interested in the business, you know, for me, it's business is fun. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's exciting. You know, what can you share about maybe the business model or, you know, how you would expect to continue to grow um, the company? Like, you know, for example, our users, are they charged to get their data and uh, analyzed? Are they charged for these consultations? You know, where, where, how does that work for, for Lawfully? Oh, yes. Uh, so we charge, um, so uh, which are some uh, of the uh, more detailed uh, analytics data. So not everybody takes that, uh, but some people, uh, they pay uh, to see the details. So that's our uh, number one uh, business model. 
And number two, uh, we charge our platform fee for the legal consultation uh, to the lawyers. So uh, that's our uh, number two uh, business model. And uh, basically, I think 90 or 95 percent of our services, of our features are all uh, provided free of charge. And um, uh, the expansion is, uh, as I said, uh, there are, we haven't yet decided what kind of um, other uh, service domain we need to aim at. But uh, obviously, uh, we will make a decision uh, based on people's need and urgency. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, a good thing, uh, really uh, a beauty of, of our business model is uh, you keep following uh, with their journey uh, from the application through uh, the approval or denial. Uh, so you, uh, you figure out where they are, uh, what they need at a specific uh, time during the journey. So um, you know, appropriate services can be provided to appropriate people uh, personalized. So that's, I think, uh, uh, what we can take advantage uh, for our business expansion. Hmm. That's really interesting. And, and it makes a lot of sense from the value perspective uh, for, for immigrants, especially because if they're genuinely new to the country, they don't know who to turn to for different services. And so, you know, very often, for example, I mean, I've heard this from, from immigration lawyers, you know, their clients may ask them certain questions about settling into the country. And, yeah. you know, some, some of the lawyers are like, listen, I don't really know how to help you with this because it's not my domain expertise. And obviously it's great for lawyers to have partners with different service providers, but then here you can sort of centralize that on a platform where if they're already using it and they're already trusting you, then that's, you know, a, a great way to, it's a great way to go. Um, yeah, that, that's really cool. Um, I want to ask you kind of one last question about this, just because uh, in the, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of talk in the news now about immigration technology. When I started this show, uh, now it's been two years, it's about two years wow. ago. Uh, and, and really, I started writing about and just looking into the immigration tech space a little bit before that. There was never there wasn't a lot of news about um, uh, venture capital. There wasn't a lot of news about acquisitions. Right. There was you know, there were a few companies that were here for a long time. There were a couple of blips in the radar with uh, VC and sort of the kind of more mainstream uh, news about immigration tech. Obviously, as you know, because you follow this, too. Over the past few years, there's been so much acquisition and new companies and venture capital rounds and different companies starting into the space. Um, you know, I know you guys raise a little bit of VC money. Uh, I still think that it feels daunting in the immigration world uh, or really any niche kind of relatively niche software to raise, you know, to raise venture capital money to, to, to really get that support from outside of the industry. So I'm curious from your perspective, you know, what are your thoughts about that? Or maybe even like advice for anybody else who's saying, look, I want to build an immigration tech company or I want to build a software platform that automates, you know, trademark issues or something kind of more specific. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts or advice on how to approach fundraising for those types of companies? Um, yes, um, my understanding and and my experience is basically uh, VCs, uh, they want to aim, they want to target a big market. Uh, so unless um, you can convince them that uh, you can grow this business like you know, to cover a multi-billion dollar uh, market, then they will think, oh, this is too small. And uh, right now, how much your revenue is, uh, it doesn't matter too much for them so even though for example uh you're losing money at the moment but you know you're growing fast and uh you can convince them uh this business is growing fast and uh it'll eventually cover a lot bigger market then uh that's when uh, the vcs are going to be interested in uh your business uh, so um, that's uh, what I learned uh, from you know, a couple times of uh, fundraising uh, rounds. And um, 
that's what uh, we are thinking all the time as well. And I think if I may give any advice uh, to the future immigration tech uh, founders, I think uh, we got to really uh, keep it in mind how to make our business bigger and uh, how to uh, make our business maybe uh, even beyond uh, the immigration. Uh, maybe you start uh, from, from immigration, but you know, go beyond that to cover much more, to make it bigger. I think that's probably uh, the key point. Hmm. Yeah. And if you have, if it's a technology company, if you're building some sort of underlying technology, maybe you could, to your point, you could use that, you know, immigration becomes just the use case and it, yes. you, know, you can go and, and do the same analysis for different data sets. Correct. And different industries. Yes. yes, correct. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's really cool. Um, you know, I, I think as we wrap up, I'm, I'm kind of curious from your perspective, where do you see technology moving the immigration industry. You know, there's a lot of B2B. I mean, I, Laborless, the company I started is a B2B software. We our, our software supports immigration law firms and employers that, you know, hire individuals. We don't support individuals directly. It's just not the, you know, it's not the kind of business that it, it mm -hmm. is. And from what I saw, immigration tech, quote unquote, was that for many years, you know, case management platforms for companies and for, for, um, for law firms, I think now there has been a shift over a few years, and and you know increasingly so today. Of you can call it B two C immigration tech. I would argue you guys are a little bit of both. Um, you know, you obviously support individuals, but you all, you have some lawyers and others, and you're you know, within the form within the lawfully ecosystem. Where do you see the industry moving? You know, uh, with technology and how it supports the immigration journey. Wow. Wow. Uh... That's a tough question. <laughs> um, I think, well, uh, this reminds me of the time when I first started this startup. Um, at the time, I had no idea and um, I was captivated by the hike of um, the AI tech illusions and stuff like that. Now, uh, it has calmed down uh, a little bit and we all know uh, there are still a lot of things that should be taken care of by people, by human beings. And technology, uh, as a tech guy, uh, I'm 100% confident. Uh, technology will make things a lot simpler, easier, quicker. However, there are still things that technology uh, cannot solve. And uh, I mean, for example, like, really complicated uh, immigration cases. AI cannot deal with that. Uh, we all know that. And uh, experienced immigration lawyers can only uh, get a solution to that, you know, like uh, after uh, spending hours and hours uh, on the case. Uh, so I think the way to go is uh, how to actually combine this technology with human aspect, human uh, uh, legal aspect or whatever uh, other aspects. So uh, by doing that, I think uh, it's really uh, almost a secure uh, future that you will have a better outcome and you will get a, a things done quickly, quick, uh, quicker and uh, easier. So I think um, AI technology uh, cannot really uh, support uh, everything on its own. And uh, human expertise, uh, legal expertise is really uh, to be, should be combined uh, with the technology. And I hope um, lawyers uh, really uh, get more interested in technology because uh, I see still many of them are not interested in technologies and many of them, they still keep their conventional way of working uh, paper and, uh, and, and phone, I think like that. So, uh, that's probably, uh, uh the way, uh, this industry should go. Yeah. I think there's a lot of discussion around robots taking lawyers jobs, quote unquote. Um, and to your point, it'll never happen a hundred percent. Uh, TurboTax did not get rid of accountants. 
uh, you know, ATMs did not get rid of banking professionals. It's just it, it, it took a small piece of the puzzle. It automated it because it was simple right. and, it let, and it let the humans do more, you know, challenging, demanding, uh, usually human centric work. Yeah. So um, it, it's great to hear from you that because there are, to your point, there are still many lawyers and, and really individuals in, in a lot of industries whose instinct is, is, you know, I don't want the technology because, you know, either I'm worried that it's going to take my job or the technology is going to try to do more than it should and it's going to fail these individuals. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I think to your point, we're not, that's not the goal. The goal is to grow in an organic fashion where you figure out with the industry, what can we move away from being done by people? And what can we give to the to computers a little bit more and a little bit more, a little bit more at a time yeah. that, you know, that isn't going to be to the detriment of, of, of the, the immigrants that isn't going to uh, take you know people's jobs in any meaningful way. Um, uh, and so, yeah, because I can't imagine any any lawyer wakes up and says, I can't wait to go to work and fill out forms. You know, there's just it's just that's not that's not the way it works. Right. And so we want to get rid of that. Um, sure. You know, in terms yeah. of the legal yeah. professional. That's what technology can replace. <laughs> exactly. Um, June, this is really awesome. I've learned so much and, and I think, you know, what you're building is is fascinating. And I, I, I love the I love the roots of it because. You know, you had your immigration experience, and, and I, your wife's an immigration lawyer. So, but the the nexus of it was also part of the work that you were doing as a physicist, which I think is just super cool. Um, before we, you know, before we end the conversation, I'm curious. You know, it's funny. You had like a map. I was mapping your journey in your life geographically. You know, South Korea. Then you went. You went a little bit uh, far away. You went to Tokyo, and then you went a little bit further away to the UK. And then, you know, you finally kind of made your way to um, the U.S. Uh, I'm wondering, you obviously, you said you have this nostalgia with regards to the U.K. And I hope no one punishes me for this. As far as I know, the U.K. is not known for having cuisine, so to speak. But but I'm curious from you, do you have a like most favorite memory, like favorite memory of a meal or like a bar or a pub or something that you know it sticks out in your mind from your time oh. there oh yeah yeah i used to have a lot of uh, pub dinner uh, and um, pub dinner uh it was first of all very cheap uh, as a student <laughs> and uh, fish and chips you know notoriously uh, uh delicious <laughs> fish and chips and uh, but actually uh in the uk i mean I'm not sure if their own food is really how excellent it is, apart from fish and chips. But in the UK, in London, there are a lot of a lot of international foods uh, everywhere. And um, because of historic uh, historical reasons, uh, there are a lot of Indian foods as well, excellent Indian restaurants. So um, to be honest, I had no problem uh, for foods in the UK. <laughs> You're not the first person to mention that. Um, I have not been to the UK for over a, a decade. Actually, so I think I was a teenager when I went. So it must have been now 20, almost 20 years. And I really want to go back and A, have fish and chips. And then B, of course, have some Indian food. Interestingly, the one of the best, re- I've never been to India, to be fair. But one of the best Indian restaurants I ever went to in my life was in Japan. Was in Japan. Uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, it was just one of the. I will never forget the restaurant, and it was so good. So, uh, you know, maybe I should stop asking that question because it always ends up being that there's obviously wonderful food all over the world. Um, but now you're making me hungry and wanting to go to the pub. <laughs> uh, so, June, thank you so much. This has been really awesome, and I've learned so much. Uh, you know about your journey, of course, and and obviously what Lawfully is building, and I'm excited to 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 continue to follow you and the company uh, because you're, you know, you're focusing on this really kind of interesting technological aspect of it, you know, really marrying AI, machine learning, et cetera, and, and, and data analysis with immigration. And uh, I feel like that's a huge part of where technology is going in this space. So good luck to you. Um, where can people find uh, the company's uh, lawfully or the website? I'm sorry, is lawfully.com. Yeah, uh, www.lawfully.com. And also you can find our apps on both Android and iOS. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. So download the app for for folks who are watching and listening. If you're going through the immigration process, 
you know, if you have a lawyer, if you don't have a lawyer, if you work for a big company or not, it sounds like it would be, and this is not, um, this is not a paid endorsement. I'm just, I, I feel like it would be, I feel like it would be cool to download the app and, you know, put in, you know, whatever data you can and, and, and get some analysis. And I think that would be really interesting, probably in addition to everything else um, that you're getting as an, uh, you know, an applicant for immigration benefits. So um, yeah, lawfully.com. And obviously, like you said, uh, Apple, Apple, or sorry, Google play and uh, Apple's app store. The app store. Yeah. So, Cool. Well, June, thank you again. I really appreciate this. this is a great conversation and uh, hope to have you back one day and share some huge news about all the, you know, newer things that Lawfully is going to be doing in the future. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. That was a great conversation. And I realize now that we had all these uh, comments here. Marianne said, I love the Lawfully app. So intuitive and easy to use. Um, you know what, June, I'm just going to bring you back here for a second. Um, just to, just for the just for purposes of the comments, just to, to oh. see it, um, we have here from Song Chell saying thumbs up. So thank you for for the comment and for watching. Uh, Eric Arnold says thank you, Roman and June. Great discussion of the immigration law tech landscape, June's story and lawfully. So thank you, Eric, and and everyone else for for watching and tuning in. I just want to bring you back on screen for that, June. Uh, thank just you so you can much. See it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really glad to see the audience. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> comments and everything so thanks all um thank everyone again so much for listening and watching and tuning in for your comments etc as always um and uh next week actually i will be off because it is the american immigration lawyers association annual conference so um i mean i'm going to be swamped at the conference at a booth and if you're going to be there stop by the booth uh, labor list will have a booth if you're not going to be there i will be back on in two weeks with another guest and another great conversation um, in the meantime, have a great weekend, everyone. Stay safe and peace out.